Hi, welcome to Sycamore Reservoir Part 2. In Part 1, I went hiking up to a feature in the Catalina Mountains called Thimble Peak, which I suspect is a fulgamite. And I think this fulgamite was instrumental in the formation of the entire mountain range. And in fact, I think fulgamites are instrumental in the formation of a lot of mountains. So it's an important concept in EU theory, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what my theory is for, for fulgamite formation and how they contribute to mountain formation. So <coughs> let me get my whiteboard out and uh, draw a little picture to describe what I'm talking about. Um, in the context of an, a, a huge electrical event, the Earth's under tremendous electrical stress and what first caused that I'm not going to speculate it could be because Mars is you know in close orbit or Venus or it could be caused by a solar event a big solar flare or you know a supernova I don't know the first cause of what put the earth into this huge electrical stress but under this stress the sky would basically be compressing down and energized and there would be a huge storm and this storm would be like we have today a thunderstorm except it would be orders of magnitude larger and the lightning bolts and so forth would would be huge and so a fulgamite forms when uh, a lightning bolt hits and you've got this storm up here in the sky and it's hitting lightning and these are large and it's sustained lightning bolts. So what would happen, I should use the black pin. What would happen is, at first, the, the lightning strikes and it's going to, you know, uh, provide a negative charge to ground. In a typical cloud to ground lightning strike, you have electrons shooting down as a result of a, of an avalanche of electrons coming out of the plasma formation up here in the clouds. <coughs> and this corona in the clouds spits lightning and when it hits Earth it it dissipates because it, it's hitting a bunch of positive charge down here on the ground. And up here in the cloud is a bunch of negative charge. So eventually though this charge if it's sustained it will continue to to uh, interact with the positive ionic matter here at ground and that matter starts to neutralize and then it starts to build up. Now, normally the return stroke of a lightning will suck this positive ionic matter up, up the lightning channel and it will uh, it'll get pulled away and that's what we call the return stroke in the lightning. Uh, and that's the flashing that we see in the lightning is that return stroke of ionic matter going up the channel. But if it's a sustained and very large strike, then what will happen is this material starts neutralizing down here and getting left behind. The lightning channel doesn't pull up neutral uh, as much neutral ma material. And so the neutralized material starts building up into a fulgamite. And that's what causes a big spire. Uh, generated by the lightning strike because the lightning is hitting here and and uh, this neutral material is just piling up and it and then and then it's also drawing into it charge from around which creates dikes and these dikes start in, start radiating out from the lightning strike and they become part of this fulgamite as well. So this is a lightning strike creating a fulgamite that's shooting out, radiating uh, the uh, current flow into pathways that are uh, basically fusing this rock together, sucking out all the electrons and leaving behind a very alkaline material. And that's what we find in, in, in the formations that I'm going to show you. <coughs> now, there's also something else going on because there's this big, huge storm. And as a result of this storm, we've got wind. 
ambient winds, not created by the lightning strike, but winds that are blowing across this plane where this lightning strike occurs. And these winds are dragging clouds of ionic matter. And this ionic matter, this dust, is then just going to start piling against this protrusion that sticks out on the windswept plane. And so that stuff starts building up. And in this event, this wind is supersonic. And so it creates a shock wave when it hits this obstruction. And it starts depositing the dust along these, uh, uh, along these dikes and along the fulgamite itself. And so the fulgamite is actually anchoring the formation of a giant dune, windblown dune. And because this is supersonic wind, these things form shock waves when it hits. So what happens when wind comes along and it hits a protrusion, then it bounces off and creates a shock wave. So this shock wave shoots out, and because of the nature of shock waves, they create triangular waveforms. And you see these triangular waveforms then are imprinted on this mountainside that's being created as it blows against this fulgamite. And so these keep building up and building up into layers and layers of triangular buttresses that are formed by the shock wave. And then ultimately these shock waves start to um, dissipate. The winds start to die. And as that happens, the shock waves break into harmonics. And then on the front side of these, you'll find the final phases building harmonic forms of triangular buttresses because these shock waves break down into harmonics and they start forming multiple waves across the front side of the mountain in its final stages. And that's exactly what we see on mountain flanks. And usually you'll see the triangular buttresses on one side and not on the other side of the ridge line. Now, from the side, what this looks like is a dune. It looks like a big, but it's sharply angled. So you have on one side, nothing, it just a cliff, because this is where the fulgamite was, and it built against this, and the dikes that stick out, it built against those. But on this side you have the ski slope, which is the triangular buttress. And, and these buttresses keep forming. So that's, in theory, what I'm talking about as a mountain formation created by the combination of a fulgamite striking and then the winds piling debris and dust against them. And of course, this is all in a highly charged electrical field and so there's fusion and molten material that is uh, fusing together and forming rocks. <coughs> so in the Catalina Mountains I feel that this is one of the mechanisms that helped create the mountain and I'm going to ultimately show this over time. But I've also looked at some other mountains up in northern Arizona and some fulgamite structures up there that I think are indicative of this process. And so I'm going to show you some pictures of that. One of the pictures here is uh, shiprock, which in, uh, in EU theory is widely believed to be uh, one of these fulgamites. And, um, and shiprock has these big dikes that stick out and they're uh, and they're made of a, a material called minette. Minette is a highly alkaline rock that is basically the country rock. It's similar to the country rock, except it's, de it's depleted of, of negative charge, and, and, it's, and what's left is a lot of potassium, which makes it a very alkaline rock. And I think that's, you know, a forensic study of this rock would, would, would be able to confirm that plausibility that it was formed by a lightning strike in this manner. The other thing that you'll see here on these, besides the dikes being formed of this minette, is that inside shiprock is this burnt mud looking material that's just like the, the dike material that I believe is minette as well. 
I haven't been able to verify that with any papers and I can't sample because I can't go up Shiprock to get a piece of it to go sample. But um, I, it, its appearance is very much that of the same material as the dikes. All around the area are more structures, buttes, that appear in the same fashion as Shiprock, only smaller events that appear to be this minette material as well. Just north of, <coughs> um, well, just inside the Monument Valley, there's this structure called a Gathla Peak. And it's one of these fulgamites that's formed of this minette material, apparently. And it sits right behind a mountain range called Combe Ridge. Combe Ridge is a monocline that I went to investigate last summer. And uh, on, on Combe Ridge, it's a monocline of these triangular buttresses. And by conventional theory, it's formed by a fault, and it's a monocline formed by a fault that, that is basically one side of the earth dropped and the other side lifted and tilted and left this standing monocline. That's the theory. I think it's one of these windblown structures and its entire you know, southern phase, which is the direction that the winds came from, are formed by these triangular buttresses. In fact, the monocline is nothing but shockwave forms of triangular buttresses. So in examining that, that's where I started developing this theory of wind against a fulgamite as a mountain formation. And now I'm looking at more complicated mountains like the Catalinas to see if I can confirm that. So I'll show you a few pictures of the monocline and, and the fulgamites that I saw up in northern Arizona and northern New Mexico. And, um, and then in future episodes, we'll come back to look more at the Catalina Mountains and see how a more complex mountain structure could be formed uh, in the same fashion. Or, or with other influences, maybe, that are going on, still sort of figuring this stuff out. <clears throat> uh, another thing I want to point out is that fulgamites that I'm seeing come in more than one form. What I just described would be actually, I think, a positive lightning strike. And that means a, in, in a conventional thunderstorm, we see positive lightning coming from the top of the cloud, from the great big anvil that's in a, in a, uh, a thundercloud. And the anvil, I believe, is the positive corona, whereas the bottom of the cloud is a negative corona. So the bottom of the cloud generates negative cloud-to-ground lightning, meaning there's negative charge being avalanched out of the top of the out of the bottom of the cloud, and, and, and connecting with Earth and creating a plasma current that is the lightning bolt. And then the return strike is positive ions being pulled back up that channel. And in a sustained event, it would create one of these, one of these forms. So um, that is sort of what I think is one thing that goes on. Um, although I, I described it a little bit wrong because I said these are negative and these would be the positive charges. If it's a positive strike, then it's positive charge coming out of the top of the cloud, the anvil and creating this fulgamite. And I see, what I'm saying is that there's, there's two types of fulgamites that I see, and they have different morphologies. And one of them, I believe, is a negative, the result of a negative cloud-to-ground strike, and the other is the result of a positive anvil top strike to the ground. And then there's other types of lightning that create other features, like ground-to-cloud lightning and that sort of thing. And there's also aerial strikes from cloud to cloud that create other other features and other events that we won't get into that right now. I just want to talk about them. my theory on positive versus negative cloud to ground lightning and the fulgamites that result from that. So this next image here is my theory on the difference between a positive and a negative strike. and. Uh, the fulgamite that forms. So what we're talking about is shown on the right-hand side 
of this diagram and that is in indicating the positive cloud to ground strike that I think formed Shiprock and, and uh, uh, Gathla Peak and this Thimble Peak that we're looking at in the Catalina Mountains. I believe those are positive cloud to ground strikes that form those fulgamites. And in future shows I'll get into the the other type of fulgamite that I'm seeing which is a negative cloud to ground strike and why its morphology is different and, and, and my theory about why that is. I have to admit I could be wrong on polarities here. The difference in fulgamites that I'm seeing may be just the opposite of what I'm describing. I really need help from, from other people who are more familiar with the electrical side of things to, to help figure this out and, and geologists who can look at the rocks and examine you know whether there are alkaline materials involved or other features of the rock that might give clues or evidence of whether they're negative or positive lightning strikes that form them. Uh, I'm simply presenting theory hypothesis about how these are formed and I'm hoping that will point the way for investigations that can confirm these things down the road. Well, we made it back to the clear water stream. I'm going to tank up on water here. Take it back to camp. Take a break in the shade. Uh, nice big shady spot here. Maybe uh, take a little bass in the water. Down here too. branches.
that's that's my new water bottle. That's my new water. I just got out of the stream. It's a whole lot cleaner looking than what I drank from last night. That's a whole lot better. Okay. That's looking back the way I just came along the trail. So I'm almost home. I mean, home back to the campsite. Sycamore Reservoir, so it's really pretty here. You can see the trees. Thought this would make a nice little view. Coming back to the campsite. And, uh, That's that really brown water that I drank yesterday, today. Now I've got some fresher stuff from the stream a mile up, and oh, I'm looking forward to drinking some of that. I gotta purify it first. So. Okay. Almost home. My feet are pretty hot and weary. <clears throat> got back to camp and when I walked up here's here's campsite so when I walked up the trail across the stream up here <laughs> the Cotamundes ran out they were in here right under the trees here not in the campsite although they might have been exploring it too that then like they got into the tent and that's where the food is so but that might have been what attracted them they were all right here. There were 10 of them right in here. And it looked like they're gathering stuff off the ground here under the trees. Nuts or, you know, pine nuts or something. So, <clears throat> they took off like a whole troop, 10 of them. Now, if you never, and most people haven't, seen a Cotamundi in the wild, it's a pretty bizarre sight. <clears throat> they, uh, Kind of rack like raccoons, I guess, except they have really long tails, long, long tails. They're longer, as long or longer than their bodies. I say probably the tails at one and a half times the length of the body, and it just flows behind them like, like, uh, uh, like a big squirrel tail when they run, and they kind of have like a hopping, loping run. And they run around in troops, in little uh, tribes. <laughs> and there were like 10 of them here. First I came up, I started crossing the river, they started running this way. And like six of them broke, running. And then the other four, kind of like one by one, jumped out of their cover and went running as I came across the creek. So I got a good close-up. I mean, I was... I was, except I didn't have the camera in my hand. It was in my pack and I didn't have time to reach for it. So I blew that. Great opportunity. Of course, you never know when it's coming. You just come around the bend and there it is. And I was not prepared. I need a GoPro so I can just strap it on my head and film as I walk. Damn. That's, that's only the second time I've seen Kota Mundi out in the wild up in these mountains. Is that I can remember offhand. So, anyway, I've never seen him that close. That was amazing. I'll never see him that close again. Fuck. Didn't have the camera. Now, I have a little toddy here. Time to rest from the hike. Sausage and onion sizzling away. I'm making dinner. I'm starving. So it's going to be sausage, onion, top ramen. 
chicken flavor with lettuce, greens in it, greens in it, squeeze a lemon, some hot sauce. Probably too helping with that. Mm. I'm hungry. That water's not bad. Okay. Fire with him. I mean... I was being dive bombed by a hummingbird. Zipping through here like a jet airplane, like a jet fighter. Here he comes. There he goes. Oh, wasn't quick enough with the camera. Watch the leaves move underneath it. Fly the leaves there. That's a good one to do. Very cool. Sun's down. Going down behind the mountain. There's still another hour or so of daylight. The bees are entertaining me. Look at the leaves and stuff jumping around underneath them. He's like four or five inches above the leaves and stuff, but they're jumping around. and stop. It's driving me crazy.
Okay, so I'm headed out. <clears throat> this is the canyon where Seven Falls. The, that's the wall of the canyon. And, uh, the reservoir is out where we camped. So it's the trees down here. Just hiked up. We're about half of the climb done coming out. I finally found some shade to park and take a little break. There's the pack all ready for me to lug it up. It's really not very heavy. <clears throat> it's not so bad. I gotta go up to this pass up here in the sunshine. can't see it, but uh, not too far to go. And then it's off to get a cheeseburger somewhere. So that's the Sycamore Reservoir trip. And uh, next trip, well, we've got to get up there a little higher altitude once it warms up a little bit. Right up there, Wilderness Rocks.